and uh, now it's my honor to welcome uh, last session of the day uh, which is titled as innovation in manufacturing we have with us dr preeta ram senior managing director from peer 70 ventures from california dr uh, mr vivek fordado director digitalization from siemens industry from atlanta and mr dave westrom vice president business development from machine matrix from boston welcome you all well, thank you, Ani. Thank you, John, for um, having me here. So uh, let me just kick off this very last session of the day by giving everybody a, an overview. Um, as, a, as a venture, as a VC firm on what we think is the future of manufacturing and transportation. And um, in the VC business, we like to believe that we are creating the future. So let's see how this plays out. Um, just a little bit about myself. I am an Atlanta person and so glad to be back here talking, even, even if it's virtually. Um, I was an entrepreneur. Um, I was a dean for science at Emory University and together with my husband, who was a faculty at Georgia Tech in the School of Computing, we created a startup. You'll see down here the team, the, the, the brave and courageous team, many of whom were Georgia Tech students. Some had just graduated, but everything. And this picture was taken actually in the strategy building. So really exciting to be back here. Um, the startup uh, open study was for high school and college learners. And the problem that it solved was out of late night help. We built um, a state of the art online social uh, learning network, uh, but for learning and with a highly engaged community of learners who would give help and, and give, get help um, raised around from um, several people, um, National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, then went over to Silicon Valley to raise an institutional round. Um, at that time, as a CEO, I was able to take the company from zero users to 16 million global users. And um, over time, we developed a predictive analytics product, which was, at that point, you know, early in its in, in predictive analytics lifetime. So um, Fast Company called us one of the top 10 most innovative companies in EdTech. And then I then, as a CEO, took it to an exit. Um, the fund itself, the Peer 70 Ventures Fund, is based and we, we invest in deep technologies that have application in both smart manufacturing and transportation and logistics. Our background, the background of the other um, two general partners, is in comes from aerospace technologies, which as you know, is full of heavy industry, manufacturing, engineering, as well as um, space applications. So we see a broad range of applications. And this is timely because we see a lot of application of these technologies in broader markets, e-commerce, for example, and we'll talk a bit about those markets now. It's a $200 million fund. We invest in early and growth stage companies that are generating revenue and have demonstrated a product market fit. Happy to talk some more about this um, in, as we get along. Um, so once again, we invest in technologies that are creating the future of manufacturing and transportation. What does this look like as our investment focus? Um, these are divided into the four buckets that most aerospace industry thinks of platforms, services, communications, and security. But if you look down here at the investment focus, for example, under platforms, we would be investing in drones, but also in the engineering and the manufacturing. Um, in services, it's a lot about what happens on the manufacturing floor, you know, the maintenance, repair, and overhaul, the vehicle monitoring, training of workers, assistance, and things like that. Communications is very important, particularly as, to, as it pertains to transportation, the logistics, um, where all of this play together and how they play with satellite tech is of importance to us. Security in the workplace has become even more important now with COVID and we'll talk about that. Here are some of the cross-cutting technologies and as you'll see, we will talk about these at some depth, AI, ML, additive manufacturing, sensors and data. But let's get to the history of manufacturing just to set the stage of where we are. Everyone talks about industry 4.0, but let's remember that it all started with the steam engines, the steam engine way back um, 1800s, and then fast forward to where electricity, the age of electricity turned everything from the power loom to, you know, uh, to production lines. And then we benefited from automation. We had computer technologies. I was in the seventies. 
And where we are today in Industry 4.0, we are in the age of connected machines, connected manufacturing, where computing completely has transformed in many ways. Well, how is that? So a little more in depth on the fourth industrial revolution, um, for example, the technology that had the most impact in the first industrial revolution was an example was the loom. Um, and then we have the we had in the second industrial revolution was the assembly line Ford motor manufacturing. And then in the third industrial revolution, we had computers coming in, the PLC, the pro programmable logic controllers. And that was when it all started. But now where we have, we have, I think the name of the game is connect connections, connectivity, and probably the cloud. One more driver we cannot ignore is the driver of COVID with the impact of this pandemic that has hit almost every industry vertical. Um, what we are seeing and what you are seeing and experiencing is the limited workforce capacity, which has led even though we would argue not, to reduce productivity. Well, how is industry going to gain ground if it doesn't solve this very important problem? Um, there is, of course, a, a constant need for increased safety and health mandates to keep the workforce safe and healthy. We're also, industries everywhere are dealing with unpredictable cycle, supply cycles and demand. How do we solve these things? How can logistics be improved? Um, the, all of these pressures are leading to increased costs and therefore reduced profits. At the same time, unfortunately, we also see widespread cyber attacks and malware infiltration. How can we then address this? So with all these drivers in mind, let me just give you at a very top level, the transforming technologies that we see that are just completely changing the manufacturing landscape. Here are nine technologies and as you look at them, um, they are, they could be as different as, as building autonomous robots or simulation, but also a common thread that comes in from the industrial IoT of things in the cloud, added to manufacturing, augmented reality, and big data analytics. I think the question for the day, the question for this audience, you all, is how do these play together? How do these manifest themselves in the manufacturing plant? and how will they impact your lives as you go forth? Whether you're an engineer, whether you're a scientist, whether you have a startup or you're the head of a large, um, large company. So let's first set the stage for the business impact of Industry 4.0, Industrial IoT or the future of manufacturing. A report by McKinsey, and you'll be able to find this if you look this up, um, where they talk about the major impact that these technologies will have on manufacturing. For example, they, they predict with the kinds of co connectivity and digital devices, forecasting accuracy will be up by a whopping 85%. We will be able to forecast things we never could have imagined before. Um, there should be a decrease in design engineering costs and my friend Vivek will surely talk up a few of about digital twin and things like that. There should be also a decrease in the inventory holding costs as we get better at predicting um, the logistics of what should and what shouldn't be there in a warehouse. Um, we certainly expect, and we are seeing uh, downtime, decrease in machine downtime with better predictive analytics. Labor productivity should go up and we'll all be much happier when that happens. Um, the cost of poor quality should also go down. So at a top level, the business impact of industry 4.0 should be overall positive. Things should do better if industry 4.0 solutions are implemented in these areas. So what is the digital backbone of this industry 4.0? What are the trends that are driving the kinds of changes? And again, this is just a subset of those nine technologies that you saw. So first off is the need for real-time data, the need for insights and connectivity, what we're gonna talk about predictive analytics, the need for simulation for analytics and robotics and automated intelligence. What we're also seeing as a trend is system integration and advanced production methods. We also are seeing 
as a key trend, the increase in human machine interaction and new ways of doing things which we couldn't have imagined before. A lot of this is being driven by technologies such as the internet of things, big data, cloud computing, machine learning, devices, new devices and apps, and of course, augmented reality. So here are the trends that are driving innovation in all of these areas. And these technologies in turn, as they fulfill the promise that you're seeing up above and the trends are driving further innovation. What does this look like? So this in a nutshell is what industrial IoT or IIoT looks like. And I love this graphic because it tells you that you have the cloud, but all around it are things, devices that are driving data transfer so that software can then transform the data into insights, actionable business insights. Without that, it's all data, it's all confusing, and you really can't do anything, can't make progress, can't move the needle on a business with that. So I love this graphic, which I borrowed from Splunk, because it tells you in a nutshell, that's what all of this is about. You've got data, it's being collected and streamed to the cloud. You've got software, which has some kind of predictive machine learning models, which then drives the data into insights, alarms, diagnostics, whatever it is you're interested in. Um, on the hardware end, you have innovation around these sensors, around networking, the cameras that pick up the movement of trucks, RFID chips, the GPS, GNSs that track them, smart beacons, monitoring systems, and much more will have to happen as this innovation proceeds. On the software side, the innovation has come in the last five years with AI-powered computer vision, ma uh, machine learning, natural language processing, and big data as well. Um, as IIoT progresses and takes over, we expect that the US uh, market to be around 91 billion by 2023. So once we have that, let's take a look at the manufacturing network of tomorrow and even today and see how things are moving around there. Um, you have to look at this and, and as you see that the dark lines indicate material flow, the yellow lines in, you know, indicate the flow of data. And as all of these things work together, you have flow of data and material between the company hub, the logistics, the warehousing, the factories, um, and everything else, and the customers. What you have is a data-rich ecosystem. It is interconnected. It is non-linear and insight rich. The data is coming from multiple sources, multiple activities, workflows and devices. And all of this has to be put together by the right software and make the right predictions or the right alerts and, and initiate the right kinds of activities at the right time. So there you have it in a nutshell. So again, back to my, my hat as a VC, when we invest in the future of manufacturing, this is, these are the trends that we're looking at. And once again, this is not all of it. I'm sure there are things that are happening out there that I am not talking about, but this is a nutshell of what we are interested in and where we see the future going. We see the future focused on people, on the digitization of workforce because people are first and foremost the most important. What does this look like? This looks like collaboration being facilitated amongst people, amongst machines. We, we see an, an emphasis on worker safety, health inspection. We see assistance coming to the factory floor by way of exoskeletons. By the way, I think this is super exciting because as you will all understand, this has come to us from medicine. From, from, physical, uh, from enabling the physically handicapped. We also see the role growing of the digital assistant. And I have a nice little example. There's a video online if you want to catch up on that. Um, in terms of the manufacturing, the, digi the digitization of manufacturing includes um, additive manufacturing. 
when you look at reliability, what does the digitization of reliability look like? There's defect um, identification. These are pure bottles and you've got a very important, of course, for all of us. How do you identify defects in that using AI? Predictive health monitoring of machines. I think uh, Vivek may well talk about that. There's also machine failure prediction. Definitely he's gonna talk about digital twin. Um, there's digitization of logistics, the supply chain, resource optimization, demand forecasting, um, warehouse optimization, supply chain optimization, how they will now include and uh, include not only GPS, but also telemetry, um, satellites to some extent to make all this happen, fleet routing and energy optimization. So as we go to the next section of this, I'm just gonna give you some examples, some exciting examples that I have seen and we are looking at. Some of these are large corporations that you all heard of and some of them are smaller startups that are doing very well. So let's take the first one. How is the workforce going to be digitized? So I'll give you three examples here. One is, a, one is augmented reality. Over here, what you're seeing is how Mercedes-Benz is working with Microsoft HoloLens remote assistance. And this, what is really cool about this is you have here a worker working on some part, some component of the car, of the Benz engine, and you have help and assistance coming from outside, an expert sitting perhaps in some other country where they're actually able to see through the HoloLens, which the worker is wearing, what's happening and target with augmented reality and actually pinpoint what needs to be done and how it should be done. Um, of course, in a world of COVID where everything is now getting increasingly um, remote and contactless, as you, you can imagine, the benefits of this are only going to accrue and improve. Um, the second example that I'll present to you is that of exoskeletons. As I said, what once was restricted perhaps to the army and perhaps in the field of medicine is now grown where you have enthusiastic adoption by companies and I've taken three car companies, Ford at the top here, you can see that little icon. Um, this is Audi and then there's also BMW and they all have different ways of looking at it. The startup there you're seeing there is called Exo, doing really well. Here you've got a Ford plant worker um, actually working on something and through you know, avoiding the stress of holding up that heavy um, tool for hours at a time while you have, um, in the second picture, an example in an Audi factory where the lady is, the lady worker is sitting on a device, an exoskeleton sort of a device. So I predict with the aging of the workforce on the manufacturing plant, we're in fact going to see a lot more of these kinds of devices. And finally, in this page, digital assistants that empower employees to receive alerts, analytics, updates. And here's an example, natural language processing, um, hi, what's happening today on the factory floor? And you get an answer in real time through a combination of things. And one of the companies here I put up is called Platain, which is working with Google and Siemens Digital Industries where they embed digital assistant technology. So you can read more about that in the links. Um, the digitization of manufacturing is, is, in our case, additive manufacturing. We see that there are advantages, less wastage, great better impact on the environment, faster, cheaper, and you only create the objects, the tools, or the components that you need. So it's almost just-in-time manufacturing. Applications are obviously in aerospace. It's taken on in a big way, medicine, transportation, and energy as well. Um, what does the digitization of reliability look like? And this is where, oh, I forgot to mention, oh, I want to tell you this, that we think of digitization of the workforce as giving superpowers to the worker. So it enables them to do things that they normally wouldn't have done. And similarly, here you have um, where you have superpowers to the processes. Um, and the big one here is, of course, predictive monitoring, predictive maintenance, which are slightly different. Predictive monitoring is to give you um, an insight before it happens so you can go and fix things even before they break down. While predictive maintenance tells you when and how and when, how not to do it. Um, just a few examples and of course visual inspection, I give you the example of the beer bottles, but of course it's far more than that, where you're able with machine vision, smart systems, AI, 
to combine all that information and then have insights, uh, quality checks, for example, in ways that human vision just can't do alone. For one thing, we can't see in all ranges of the spectrum, visible spectrum, what's only what we can see. But with these devices, we can see far beyond. We can see at a higher, with, with machine vision, we can see at a higher level of, you know, we can see smaller objects and we don't get time and machines don't get tired. So quicker, faster, cheaper, and in many ways better. Um, digital twin, as uh, we're gonna hear, is when you have a highly um, complex models of the real world objects, but a far, and, and you know, in aerospace, we've started out with simulation, but this is simulation on steroids. You have complex real world objects, virtual 3D environments, real time updating of what's going on, whether it's a plane or an engine that enables the, the person um, back home in the manufacturing plant and engineering plant to actually do things and have insights that they couldn't. Um, saves cost, you can tweak things around, test it out before you actually put it into production. And finally, the digitization of logistics. I've talked about machines and, and engineering plants. I want to also bring an example that we're all familiar with, that's food. Um, Lineage Logistics is a company, and it's a pretty large company based here, where they're just taking logistics to a, to a different level. You know, their problem is they have to deliver supplies like fresh food or maybe maybe meat from cold storage um, to, to uh, restaurants. How do you then predict what what should be at the front of the warehouse, what should be at the back of the warehouse, what should be ready to load so the restaurant can get a freshly delivered bag of red peppers as the case may be. And so they're using AI to predict the path of its orders. They're using um, AI in other ways for fleet management as well. They're using it to um, with, with RFID and all that to figure out where is everything. So that's lineage logistics. Um, take a look at this, this Fast Company article, it's very cool. Everyone knows about warehouse automation. It's big with Amazon and, and Walmart. And I just wanted to add this note here that in 2019 alone, there were 800 to 900 venture-backed fundraising rounds in this area in itself. So it's definitely an area of growth. We're going to try to get to do this better, faster, cheaper. Um, and it's going to be the way of the future. Once again, think about the implications of COVID, workers on the field, um, we can get this done and keep up productivity at such a situation. Um, fleet routing, as I start looking at that, you know, I talked about telemetry, I talked about satellite tech, but it was really cool for me to go and read this article about Rolls-Royce, which has partnered with, uh, with Google to create an autonomous ship an autonomous ship, I mean, it's not only a car, but an autonomous ship out in the waters, um, navigating, reacting to weather conditions. So all of that is extremely cool and the way of the future. UPS is using AI powered GPS tools to create again, a very efficient um, route for its fleet and, and logistics. So that in a nutshell is, is kind of the overarching sense of where I'd like to leave you with. These are some of the things that are happening every day around us today and where innovation will abound. So with that, I turn this back to you, um, Ani, and you. I will stop sharing right now and let you. Thank you, Pika. That was an awesome presentation. Now we need to move on to our next uh, speaker, Vivek. Okay, so uh, thank you, Annie, and uh, uh, the organizers for uh, uh, allowing us, uh, on behalf of Siemens, for me to share some some, th some thoughts about digitalization. Um, so let me go to the you know next slide here. Um, the topic is manufacturing innovation, and uh, uh, Siemens has been. Uh, you know, considered as, uh, say, uh, innovative company or innovative leader right from its inception in uh, 1847 uh, with the invention of the telegraph. Uh, beyond that, we have been recognized for, uh, uh, you know, many other, uh, in many other areas like uh, sustainability, diversity. And although Siemens is originally a German company, we have a fairly large footprint in the US with uh, about actually 15% of our employees are in the US 
and we serve over 20,000 customers with uh, about $2.5 billion uh, in revenues. Um, I myself have been with Siemens for a long time as well, just 23 years, <laughs> um, and uh, I've enjoyed every part of it. Um, Siemens really offers a lot of technology, a lot of uh, great people to work with, and uh, yeah, it's it's been fun all the way. Um, with that, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about our organization. Uh, as you know, uh, we've had a recent uh, organizational uh, change in the sense we have a new CEO. And uh, uh, our fiscal year at Siemens starts in October. So as of this month, we are living this new organization. Um, so uh, the first one is the digital industries. Uh, that's, that's the business I come from, and I will be talking a little bit more deeper in, uh, about this topic. We have smart infrastructure. This is all about connecting, building automation, energy, networks. Mobility is uh, our, uh, sy our mobility systems like trains and uh, everything connected to, to mobility. Siemens Advanta is a fairly new uh, organization. It's the consulting arm of Siemens Advanta. Uh, portfolio companies are, are different companies like uh, uh, large drive applications for shipping, for mining, uh, uh, very specialized applications. Uh, these have been kind of addressed in portfolio companies to address their specific uh, niche markets. Uh, and last but not least, we have the uh, Siemens Heldeniers, uh, which focuses on, on um, health systems. So um, what is Siemens Digital Industries about? Um, so th this is like the name says, digital industries. We enable our customers to participate in the digital transformation uh, and build a platform to address these uh, technologies Preeta addressed in her, in her presentation. To, to be able to transform into this, this new under, uh, industry 4.0 uh, generation or phase to be able to uh, enhance their market share, to enhance their margins and to be successful. Uh, in, in the next slide, I want to show you some, some of the customer uh, drivers we, we are addressing. So the main drivers as we identify them from our customers are productivity, flexibility, time to market, and environmental efficiency. So in the machine building space, uh, with our platforms, we enable them to, for example, reduce the commissioning time. And I'll go more into the example of a digital twin where I can show how this is, this is possible. Um, other drivers are flexibility or customization. This is uh, an example from the chemical industry. We see this a lot also as a driver in the automotive industry. Um, and our platforms enable customers to produce more flexibly. If there's a change in the batch, if there's a change in the customer requirements, these changes have to be implemented in the design and the production. Um, we are also very, very, very relevant or strong in the aerospace. Uh, we uh, support our the OEMs, the aerospace manufacturers, to reduce the development time uh, by a lot less. Uh, in the COVID time, this is maybe not so relevant, but pre-COVID time, uh, you all know that the aerospace industry had a significant backlog. Um, in terms of env environmental efficiency, uh, we ha have a lot of products where our customers can have significant uh, uh, time savings uh, with energy consumption. Uh, so how did we get there? Um, this slide will show you um, that starting from 2007, uh, at this, that point, point of time, we were world leaders in automation. Um, and we have, we have invested more than $10 billion uh, in, in, 
in the acquisition of various companies which you see here the first one was UGS and you know me uh, know these popular brands like Enixcam uh Enixcam Team Center Team Center is a is a is a significant backbone of our uh software digital enterprise and what this has enabled us to do is it has uh, allowed us to merge the so called real world which which is more the automation side of things with the virtual world and we had and we started back in 2007 so now we are at a stage where we can offer comprehensive and integrated solution in terms of what we call a digital enterprise platform which brings technologies of iot 4.0 together um and also the other thing is that siemens has factories of their own so we deploy these uh portfolio elements in our own factories uh, thus uh, we can we can um, really you know try this out how we are able to um bring these two worlds together and we have shown in our own factories that that using this philosophy of this virtual and real world can really <clears throat> increase the performance productivity of your factories so how does that work i mean we have a uh, so called the digital twin of the product what does this do so we design the <clears throat> product in a virtual environment and you can simulate this in a virtual environment with all the parameters uh in any domain whether it's electronics fluid mechanics uh and make sure that before you manufacture the products that these products are really uh, that what you want from a feature perspective from a requirement perspective um without having any without needing any physical prototypes so the next step after that is to understand okay how do i actually manufacture this virtual product in a virtual production so we have the capability to fully simulate a virtual production see what how this product will be produced in this virtual production and optimize uh have the first optimization loop between the digital twin of the product and its run on on the uh, digital twin of production so having done that uh, we move to the the real production and in the real production we have of course our automation products these automation products are built to come to communicate digitally with the software be it upstream or be it back to the uh, to the design flow which we call the horizontal integration so the part about the the uh, area where we we capture data from from the uh, real production uh, to the uh, to the uh, analytics whether it's cloud based so we have mindsphere for example where we can take the data do predictive analytics uh, to optimize the production the production loop as well as the design loop that's what we call as the digital twin of performance so we have the digital twin of the product a digital twin of the production and a digital twin of the performance so uh, i want to go a little bit deeper um, and take machine tools as an example uh, so we have recently uh, released a new product called cinematic one so cinematic is our cnc platform which is completely uh, so called digital native so what does this mean this is right from the inception of the product um it's capable of fully having uh, a digital twin uh, which we can offer to the customer so here you can see uh, this is basically a cnc machine and for those who don't know cnc machines are typically used for metal cutting 
but also the other applications. Um, so uh, these digital twins become very valuable in the not only in the product like life cycle of the machine tool itself, but in the in the manufacture of the products. So uh, you can see uh, th there's some videos. I hope these videos are uh, not, I mean, streaming well. So uh, in the past, we had we had a sequential flow from a concept design and design meant mechanical design, electrical design, software design, and commissioning. This was had to be done sequentially because uh, unless you had you know a proper mechanical design you couldn't move ahead with the electrics and uh, have your PLC software, which is basically the software which runs the machines uh, to work. So now that everything is in a virtual environment, we are able to have a kind of a parallel engineering where you are, where you're closing or uh, the time to market uh, uh, in the sense that you can come faster to the, to your final design stage and uh, uh, you don't have to do any any too many iterations um, without a physical build. So you can, in a physical world, do the iterations and come to the most optimal design. So, and not only that, we also see benefits when a machine builder has, for example, created a digital twin and he, we can merge these two processes of the, the virtual twin and the real machine to further optimize, gather data from, from a running machine and to, to uh, enhance the, the design of the machine itself. So this definitely, uh, so the big benefit is that uh, with the digital twin, uh, when a machine builder is selling to the end user, um, often there is some information loss. And finally, when it comes to handing over the machine, uh, you know, uh, there are some, some, you know, conflicts in terms of not holding up to what was promised or not. But, but with the digital twin, you can really see how the machine is op operating. Does it have the performance? Does it bring the cycle time? Um, and uh, that's why it's it's really a win-win situation. So what you see here is basically a summary of what I said. You have the machine builder here who designs his machine in a vertical in a virtual environment. Um, is able to uh, for his processes have less capital commitment. It's faster to the market, like I said, and maybe also uh, can think of new business models uh, based on this digital twin. Uh, and uh, this is from a say a machine builder perspective, and from a end user perspective, that's that's the consumer of the machine. Uh, he could, in fact, buy a digital twin from the machine builder, and uh, the end user he is more concerned with uh, the machining of this this part, for example, here uh, to ensure there's no collision. Uh, to ensure that uh, the tooling is right, uh, to make a test run of the program, uh, thus really um, on one hand, uh, reducing significant risk. Uh, it can be used for training of the operator that an operator does not have to be trained on the, on the real machine. They could use the digital twin of the machine, uh, thus uh, saving valuable machine resources and availability as well. So that, that is uh, a quick deep dive. I'm really going fast here, uh, just to keep some time for questions um, about, about what, what we have been capable of achieving in terms of merging the real world and the, and the virtual world together. Um, so uh, in terms of, uh, Ani asked me to talk a little bit about, about what we have done um, uh, regarding the pandemic, what the impacts have been. So let me uh, show this 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 quote here from from Forbes, which says that that COVID, uh, because of COVID, uh, there will be there will be a sig significant drive uh, in in innovation. 
And uh, I will show you some examples why we also, we've actually seen that happen. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, and there's, there's a real need. Uh, and I think in one way, COVID came at a time when, when a lot of digital capabilities were available. So uh, we could utilize a lot of it to, to, to a large extent. So, um, so what we see the powerful reasons for, for digitalization automation now is to, to enable, enable industries to continue working, whether it be through uh, remote diagnostics, remote monitoring, uh, all those cloud-based technologies we have, predictive maintenance. Um, they, help, they help also restart after following the, following the lockdown, we're able to pull up archives of uh, machines and make, you know, uh, make it easier to restart. Um, and uh, in the next slide, I will show you some of the examples what we have done uh, during this difficult pandemic time. Um, so we have, we have solutions for additive where we offer a very integrated approach, similar to the approach what I showed you for the machine tools with the digital twin and uh, being able to, to virtually validate designs, uh, thermal simulations of the product. Uh, so we were able to help uh, health organizations uh, in manufacturers of ventilators and masks and these kind of things. Um, uh, as an example, uh, I just talked about some of the digital tools and capabilities. Obviously, with 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 uh, being able to design a virtual machine, you don't have to be on the shop floor to do it. You could do a lot of things virtually. So that has uh, enabled people to work from home uh, also with our, our cloud-based platform. And here's a very interesting one. Um, we'll not go through all of them, but the uh, so we have a RTLS product. It's it's basically a, um, a real time uh, tracking, uh, which was which was used for um, actually tracking of products. Uh, but people within the company, and this was for our production, came up with the idea to use this for contact tracing. So basically, these are RTLS devices, which are or tags which every person is wearing, and uh, there are sensors mounted on the on the ceilings of the floor, which can then track how close the people are coming to each other. Um, and uh, in in and, and in case somebody uh, has COVID or something, then you know who this person has been in touch with. You know, for example, when a person a person is coming too close uh, or not maintaining the social distancing, uh, the tag beeps and people can just you know uh, try to try to be more careful uh, let me put it this way um, yeah these are some of the and of course we were involved in the face ma masks and ventilator device production uh, some of the things what what Siemens was uh, proactively engaging in, in during the pandemic times last but not least I would like the the final topic from my side is my experience, especially talking to companies where we supported them to enable their IoT transformation, um, is that everyone is kind of in a similar situation that it's it's a new technology and a lot of things. And, and uh, uh, what we have done is to establish a collaborative platform that people can share. And not only, it's not only about sharing information, this is about uh, driving standards. It's about uh, what technology works uh, for some people and maybe not. Uh, and there are so many things to be addressed, legal topics, uh, data ownership, uh, what standards, what connectivity standards do you need? So uh, this has been established in, in Europe, uh, Germany, Italy, um, uh, some Asian countries as well. And we are in the process of rolling this out in North America. It's not actually we, Mindsphere is a is a set independent legal entity. Uh, Siemens uh, sees a lot of value in this. And uh, uh, we feel that even talking to the members in, in um, Europe, uh, they say we, you can't do it alone. It's it's this has to be a collaborative effort moving into this this IoT phase, especially for 
IIoT, which is the you know industry standard uh, for technologies to establish themselves. So um, if you are interested in joining this, if your company has the has the need, uh, uh, we'll we'll be happy to uh, let you know how you can get uh, become a member here. Uh, here you can see some of the uh, members, uh, member companies, quite international, some international names here uh, who have already uh, joined the, the, uh, this collaboration forum. So that was really quick. Uh, I hope that was not too fast. Uh, it's a lot of stuff in little time. So uh, thank you again for your attention. And uh, yeah, with that I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Vivek. Appreciate uh, very uh, nice and deep presentation. I'm sure we will have a lot of questions. I have received five, six texts already for your and Peter's presentation. So we'll see how we can handle the, all the questions which will come in. Dave, are you with us live? Okay. Can you please share your uh, presentation, sir? So uh, thank you, Ani, and thanks for the chance to present today. Um, talked to you a little bit about uh, machine metrics and our view of uh, innovation in the uh, Internet of Things, industrial Internet of Things space. Um, just as a quick background, I'm responsible for business development at Machine Metrics. I've been with the company for a couple of years. Um, prior to that, I was um, with a number of startups in the um, industrial software, internet of things, and enterprise mm -hmm. software space, including most recently, I was part of the executive team at a company called ThingWorks, which was an early pioneer in IoT and was acquired by PTC. Um, prior to that, I was also part of the exec team at a company called Lighthammer, which was acquired by SAP and subsequently became SAP's uh, industrial IoT software platform. So uh, that is a background, just getting into machine metrics. We provide uh, an industrial internet of thing platform for machines, specifically for discrete manufacturing plants. Um, so those are plants that make primarily uh, discrete parts uh, or products, includes um, industries such as uh, medical device, uh, industrial, um, oil and gas, um, just, just to name a few. Um, our customers, uh, we have in five short years, we have uh, implemented um, connections to thousands of machines with hundreds of customers uh, across the globe. And uh, these are just a representative example of a few of those. Um, our customers we find in, in these manufacturing plants uh, are challenged in a number of areas, um, but primarily their, their productivity from their machines uh, tends to be much, much lower than, than they, they realize when they're collecting data manually. And most of our customers that we start out with uh, prior to machine metrics um, they, they collect data from their assets through manual means. Um, they capture the data, they input it into a spreadsheet or some other software program. Um, and this, um, this typically impacts their productivity. Uh, so one of the big benefits from adding machine metrics is, is the ability to uh, visualize uh, utilization and other key performance indicators and then track those through continuous improvement initiatives. Uh, this quote from Cisco, where 76% um, of industrial IoT implementations result in failure, um, we believe this is caused by a number of factors. Um, one is the, the inability of customers to achieve value rapidly. Um, and that is, that is driven by a couple of factors, but it's, it's primarily the time that it takes to connect these software packages to the machines and to um, be able to uh, create what I would call consumable data. 
either data that can be consumed by the users, by other systems, by other parts of, of the factory or the enterprise. Um, and, and the challenge there is, is transforming the data. So there are a lot of uh, these technologies that can connect to the machines that provide connectors, but then that data has to be contextualized. It has to be transformed so that, so that it can be consumed. So if you want to either visualize it through dashboards, consume it in reports, um, apply analytics, machine learning, other technologies, the data has to be cleansed and transformed and contextualized so that it can be consumed. And in many cases, this is a, this is a, a, a painstaking process that can take months, if not years for some companies. Um, Machine Metrics has automated that entire process. So uh, we're able to connect to a machine, transform data from any machine, regardless of make, model, brand, year, vintage, uh, and do that automatically, literally in a matter of seconds so that the data is consumable. Um, the other challenge with this failure rate is the uh, inability with, I would say, older packaged applications for companies to innovate. Um, I define innovation as creating new business processes. So being able to do something new with the data, oftentimes through uh, connecting to other systems and tying different data sets together. Um, so uh, this, is, this is an area that, again, was difficult with packaged applications. It's, um, it's much easier with the newer platforms and the modern technology. Um, but what we've tried to do with machine metrics is provide the best of both worlds, the ability to rapidly generate value, um, but also the ability to extend the system and innovate around new business processes. And I'll mention some examples of that as, as we go along. So our, our offering consists of an edge platform that allows for the connection to the machine in a plug and play way with transform data. Um, our our cloud-based platform, which we, we leverage AWS for that. And again, packaged applications, dashboards, tools, uh, that are provided uh, immediately uh, through, our, through our offering. Um, we connect, uh, as I mentioned, to any machine, any make, model, year, vintage, control system, or older machines without control systems. And this becomes very important because we find that the manufacturing plants and the companies we deal with, very rarely do they have just one type of in their plant or one type of control system. Often they have many, many different types of machines. They have, they have different control systems and they want a common user experience across the entire plant. They want a common data infrastructure across the entire plant. And that's, and that's been a challenge in the past. But with machine metrics, the ability to connect to these machines. So if you imagined a, a factory with let's say 30 different machines, each machine, different make, different model, different year, different control system. Some of them don't have control systems. Machine metrics, assuming those machines are networked, would be able to provide one edge device, connect to all of them, and then provide common uh, user experience, dashboards, diagnostic tools, reports uh, to all those machines, literally in a matter of uh, minutes. So with, with COVID, uh, and this is, this is just a graphical showing that, that specific edge device that I mentioned, um, but with, with COVID and some of the previous speakers have mentioned this as well, um, it's created additional challenges. So, um, you know, this has to be made uh, easier because vendors aren't allowed now to come into plants as easily. Um, our customers uh, don't have as many workers in the plants. They have fewer people in the plants. So our ability to be able to just ship one of these green boxes to a customer, um, have them hook this up themselves. Literally, we don't have to go to the plants. Uh, two years ago, um, roughly half of our uh, implementations were performed by, by our team in our customer plants. Today, 
it's roughly 10%. So 90% of our implementations are done by our customers where we don't have to go to the plant. We support them remotely. They're able to connect to their machines and, and they're up and running literally within hours. Um, so this is becoming a bigger issue as some of the earlier speakers mentioned. Uh, doing more with less, having visibility into the plant, um, being able to remotely service equipment. These are all capabilities uh, enabled by this. Um, this is a, just a quick example of some of the diagnostic tools we provide. Um, not only having visibility to the data, but the ability to set up your own workflow triggers, trick, create and trigger your own business processes, whether that be through the machine data, the operational data, which includes, includes inputs and data from operators, other participants in the manufacturing process. So to be able to create your own, your, your own processes, innovate around those processes, uh, I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Um, for one example, by tying machine data and operational data in with financial data in an ERP system, uh, our customers are now able to look across their plants and across their enterprise and make decisions on the purchase of new equipment um, based on a number of factors, like, like their capacity, uh, their utilization, their, their performance. Um, whereas in the past, it might be, you know, a plant manager decides, hey, we need to, you know, we made the, need to make a million dollar investment in a new machine. Uh, there's been very little data to support that. Now the data is there, the insights are there, and these kinds of investments can be, can be better justified. Um, leveraging this data with uh, human resource systems for things like performance reviews for operators. Um, these are just a couple of, of many examples. Uh, maintenance systems. In the past, uh, CMMS systems for maintaining equipment uh, preventative maintenance was done strictly based on a schedule because these systems didn't have access to the real-time machine data or uh, factors like how long has the machine been running? What's the load on the machine? Um, maintenance wasn't, wasn't, it was set up on a schedule, not on, uh, not on based on these other factors where it could truly be optimized. So with, with real-time machine data, this changes the paradigm in a number of these, these areas. Um, the business processes are dynamic. They're able to change. The performance improves for the manufacturer. It also improves for the machine builder, as Vivek mentioned in his presentation, uh, and, and other constituents in the process. Uh, this is just, just a quick example of, uh, of what a uh, machine metrics implementation might look like in a plant. This is one of our customers. You can see that the operator has his own uh, screen, his own tablet in front of his station. And then above him is a, uh, a larger screen for perhaps a supervisor or a plant manager showing how a number of different machines uh, are performing. Um, from, a, uh, from, a, from a partner ecosystem, um, our focus is on uh, really enabling the different, the different partners to focus on what they do best. We work with machine builders um, who want to remotely service their equipment and who want to optimize their machines. We believe they're the domain experts when it comes to their machines. Um, but we also understand that it's very hard for a machine builder to sell their own IoT platform simply because in manufacturing plants, a manufacturer isn't going to buy an IoT software offering from a machine builder and put it on another machine builder's machine. And in many respects, that, that applies to control systems companies as well. So again, to be able to provide that underlying infrastructure for a machine builder to optimize their machines, and then for the manufacturer, their, the manufacturer's domain expertise is around their processes. So again, allowing the 
process manufacturer to optimize their processes, the machine builder to optimize the performance of their machines. We believe this provides the best model to move the industry forward mo most rapidly. Um, we're doing a lot of work in predictive maintenance, but we're also providing the underlying data infrastructure for our partners and customers to do predictive maintenance as well. The breakthroughs that we've made in predictive maintenance have been in, in leveraging high frequency data to actively act, predict um, tool failures and tool wear and to do this at scale. So the challenge with predictive maintenance um, has been that Frankly, it just hasn't been very scalable. It's very service intensive. There are a lot of variables. Um, it may work with one type of, of machine in one certain situation uh, where you have, to, oftentimes you have to add sensors and other devices to the machine. Uh, our approach is to uh, leverage the data from the control system uh, without having to add sensors and do this in a way that's, that's repeatable and predictable. Um, we, have, we have working customers now that are leveraging this technology, but as I said, we're also providing the underlying infrastructure so that data scientists from our partners and our customers can also build their own algorithms and develop their own approaches. Um, extensibility in, in terms of leveraging other tools, we provide tools out of the box but our customers will often uh, have their own tools such as, um, uh, such as BI systems like Power BI, Tableau, or others where they'll want to do comparative metrics across plants. Uh, this allows them to take best practices, optimize their processes, understand things like, you know, why is it that such and such operator on a certain machine at this plant uh, performs 20% better than everyone else on similar machines at other plants. These are the kinds of questions that customers are asking, and these are the kinds of processes that they're looking to optimize. And, and lastly, um, our approach is to really kickstart uh, a never-ending continuous improvement initiative, where, as I mentioned er earlier, our customers achieve very rapid value but continuously leverage the data to identify, prioritize continuous improvement initiatives and drive value throughout, throughout the life cycle uh, of their investment in machine metrics. So we have many examples of this. This is, this is just one example, but I will, I will stop there so that there's hopefully time for some questions. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Excellent presentation. And with this, I would request uh, Preeta and Vivek to join in with their videos. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. This was uh, really, really very cool. Very close to my heart <laughs> in terms of what I'm doing with my company, Marshall Automation. And uh, I have a question. I'll start with Preeta. You know, uh, Innovation in manufacturing uh, is uh, an excellent idea and we are forced to do it, we are doing it. But, uh, you know, as, as a company owner uh, of somebody who's doing working with CNC machines and manufacturing, when I look at my India partners and is a mid-sized company, when we talk about innovation, you know, they really don't have time, you know, in terms of running the day-to-day -day operations. So how much time will it take when it, comes down from big boys to the street? That's the main question. How much time will it take for innovation? Or yes. How much time will it take? To reach from, uh, you know, Ford and Audi and BMW to small to mid-sized companies. You know, in terms of, you know, like the, the practicality of the operation and the investment which goes into ramping up to these kind of systems which are very innovative but seem to be very futuristic to a common man from the street? I can address parts of that, Ani. Um, I can't give you an answer that it'll take 10 days or five, five years um, because honestly, it really depends upon the company and the culture. Innovation is always difficult. 
But I can say this, that this is the innovation, and uh, as I've talked about, is being driven on both sides of the spectrum. You have large companies and you have Siemens right there that are driving it downwards, um, that have adopted it and are working with their customers, as well as small startups that, have, that are innovating and that are small and agile and are pushing it upwards. So they, and, and in fact, Vivek is probably a better person um, that, that, that they acquire small companies that have this innovation, which then gets incorporated, which then gets pushed out. So I think it's, a, it's, it's actually getting driven on both sides of that equation. And yes, it's difficult, um, but it's, it's now, now we have an excellent reason to ask ourselves, you know, do I do the difficult thing and then I might survive or do I not do the difficult thing and then I don't survive. And so Vivek actually should answer that question. He had all the data also on, um, on how this digital companies that were able to digitalize themselves because they already had the, they had already had the digital affordances are the ones that are doing well in this economy. I think I would turn this over to Vivek. Thank you. Sure. Should I take that? <laughs> okay. So, um, Okay, um, well, um, it's difficult to say how much time or to dictate a time, I would say. Uh, finally, I mean, it's about, uh, for most of the smaller or mid-scale companies, it's about uh, ROI, right? So I have to invest this amount of money and how long will it take for me to get uh, ROI out of it, whether it's by saving on quality or by saving on downtime, better productivity. So um, I would recommend in this case to start in small steps, right? I mean, uh, I think David presented something about mission monitoring. So we could, you know, typically uh, a small job shop could say, okay, I'll monitor my machines. I'll see, you know, uh, where are my pain points? Uh, let's let's start with the low hanging fruits and address those. Um, and, and then, you know, move on to the say more bigger projects uh, on a staged approach. That's that's uh, uh, what we have seen. Um, you know, customers uh, do and be successful. Uh, but I agree. I mean, uh, many are still a little bit holding back because of these are fairly new technologies, and uh, uh, sometimes they do need some handholding. Uh, that's why I'd also address this. Uh, this Mindsphere world, which is a collaboration forum where people can exactly do this. They can share the information, they can benchmark, they can ask this, hey, what went wrong in your project, right? So I think this is, this is a very important factor to be able to talk to other people and share experiences in this new technology field. Great, wonderful. So I have a question now uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Jorge Fernandez, uh, question is, why is the U.S. so good at innovation but so low to adopt? It's the same question, which I asked in a different way, uh, but please go ahead. Anybody can take the crack. I, I would take offense to the low to adopt business. What is that? What do you mean low to adopt? I guess we adopt. I mean, look at look at Siemens there. Look at look at look at uh, Vivek sitting right there. Um, I think the issue is that we adopt things differently to say Asia does. So obviously the drivers are different, the value propositions are different, the cultures are different. So I think it's not a question of. I would definitely not. I would strike slow off, and say definitely we adopt different things. Um, and it's, and it's geographically, like what we adopt, for example, in Europe, there's all of this, this uh, the controversy about data privacy, and which is different to us and probably very different to Asia. So our adoption rates of different things will be very, very different. I'll give you an example, National Health Service, UK, when, when COVID came, they were able to adopt um, things like contact tracing and other analytics, which they probably would not have, but they did because they were under the gun, which even now in the US would, would be and still is very different. So I, I don't think where it takes longer to adopt. It's, it's a question of what the market is ripe and ready for and which is different in different right. markets. Yeah, I think, I think for, for manufacturing specifically, what, what we see is again, that the time to value 
um, is 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 challenging, and that there there's there's a myth that you can just uh, connect to you know software to these machines, and all of a sudden you you know you you've got predictive analytics, and you've got all these other things, and there's this big step in the middle where you've got to you've got to transform the data to make it consumable. Um, and that's what's, a lot of that is what's really um, setting people back because they get involved in this, then they find out it's nine months. Uh, they've got a whole team of data scientists. They can't even apply analytics because they, they don't have data structured in a way to apply it. They're not getting any value. And then they have, they have we work with large companies that have teams of people that are simply holding up this, this code that they've written all over the place to connect to different machine assets. There, there's no added value in that. It's a misallocation of resources and it's hurting these companies. So I think a lot of it is, is you know, innovation's important, getting to initial value is important. You gotta be able to do both at the same time. Otherwise there's failure, companies get discouraged and then they bail out of these initiatives. Well, with this, my time is for this session is up. I really want to thank you, Preeta, Vivek, and Dave for uh, being with us today. Uh, this was really a fascinating session, a lot to discuss. And I'm sure Dr. McIntyre was ready with his five questions. And before he gets on to the call, I would like to say we are going to call off this oh. edit. I would like to invite you. Uh, to attend our day two of the program, which starts at 8.30 a.m. sharp tomorrow morning. And we have wonderful sessions, innovation in the post-pandemic, onwards and upwards, a keynote by uh, President CEO of Newell Brands. Uh, then we have a presentation by Development Authority of Fulton County, India Goes Global, a presentation by ICICA Bank, healthcare system developing and development uh, in the pandemic as well as Southeast global manufacturing region. And then we have uh, COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics and closing keynote remarks by our council general.